Hello everyone, thank you for being uh, to our symposium D-Trans or the phenomenon of discontinuation of gender affirmation process in young people, some preliminary results. I'm Annie Pollen saint passant I use she, her pronoun. I am professor at the University of Montreal and uh, today I'm with uh, Denise Medico. I use she, her pronoun and I'm professor at the Department of Sexology at the University of Quebec in Montreal. So before we start, we thought we would do a little bit of context about why that sort of project uh, was important. Uh, we know that over the past uh, 10 years or so, we've heard about more and more uh, young people uh, who affirm uh, themselves as trans or non-binary. Um, so they say that they've got a gender identity that does not match their sex assigned at birth. Um, and so that is on the basis of their self-identification and trans-affirming practices is quite clear about the importance of like following the child's lead. Um, we're going to talk about the term trans in the context of the project as a, an umbrella term, so it includes a variety of gender identities. Um, and we know also that uh, for those young people, in order to leave their affirmed gender identity, some of them will decide to pursue some transition, may they be social transition by changing the way they present to others or changing their name or uh, using different gender uh, pronoun. Some people will go for legal transition, though this is not available everywhere in the world, but certainly uh, in Quebec where we are based, young people um, can do uh, a legal change on their birth certificate and uh, ask uh, the uh, government to basically uh, put the right letter, so either F or M. It's still binary, uh, it's changing in our jurisdiction. And some other young people will decide to go for a, a medical transition, uh, often starting by puberty blockers at the onset of puberty and following later a little bit by uh, some uh, almond uh, therapy. And eventually some may decide to go for surgeries. Um, so while the majority of young people seems to continue uh, with these transition, um, a small proportion say uh, they, uh, they have or they want to uh, detransition or desist uh, they dis or discontinue their transition. In fact, as you can see, there's a lot of terms that are used to talk about different phenomena. So even the term that we are using is not always clear. Um, so we have a small proportion of those young people who detrans. Um, but currently there's a blind spot uh, in research about this subject. Uh, and, and while we can see that uh, in newspaper articles and even in some policies, we're starting to talk more and more about the trans youth, those who decide to discontinue with their transition, uh, there's really little research that has been uh, done on that topic. Um, and so uh, the team uh, a few years ago uh, faced with like an increase in, in terms of like media outlet talking about those young people, but the little research available, we decided to uh, present uh, a project that was uh, funded by the uh, Social Science and Humanity Research, research Council of Canada. So that was funded in 2020. Um, and so we decided to uh, to start looking into that a little bit further uh, in, uh, in order to really uh, develop an understanding that is based empirically. Uh, so uh, we attempted, we are attempting to uh, respond to those following questions. So what are the experience of those young people who discontinue their transition? How are these uh, process experienced by young people? How do they define their identity? Uh, what knowledge do professionals with expertise on trans self report on the subject? Uh, and how are defined, characterized, named the phenomenon linked to the transition in the media and social media? Um, so you can see that it's very broad and you must be thinking, well, this is too large for one research project and I'm going to move on to our research objective. Uh, because basically uh, our main research question is what is understood to be the discontinuation of trans uh, detransition resistance and the goal is to understand the discourse surrounding the idea of detransition uh, among young people and how we did uh, as you will see in the different presentation that we will have 
today is that we decided to present three pilot projects that are all interlinked. Um, we uh, have done interviews with young people. We're going to talk in depth about that a little bit later. We also did a survey of professional working in trans health and a discourse and content analysis. And the idea behind that is that we use those three stream of knowledge uh, and we put them together at the end to uh, be able to understand from different perspective what is uh, discontinuation of transition or the transition or whatever, however people decide to name it. Um, finally, I would just say one thing uh, before uh, I pass the speech to Denise, but uh, we have um, targeted that uh, project using a, a trans affirming approach. And, and the way we see that is, is really that gender is fluid and may change. So for us, uh, we really wanted to uh, explore these questions with, uh, it's really from, really from an exploratory uh, perspective. Uh, we didn't want to uh, to see it as, as as necessarily going back. Also, we understand gender as being fluid, being uh, able to evolve. And so we really want, we are curious to learn about the young person's journey, the professional will follow them to really understand a little bit better what they're going through. Thank you, Annie. Uh, let me introduce now our research team that is based on different universities and with different uh, backgrounds and expertise. So Annie, a feeling of social work, myself uh, from sexology and psychology and with clinical experience. Uh, we have also Alexandre Barry, uh, who is a philosopher, uh, specialized in feminist studies and associate professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Ottawa. Melanie Millet and Olivier Turbid, both are professor in communication. Uh, Melanie Millet is associate professor at the Department of Social and Public Communication at UCAN, member of the Communication and Digital Laboratory, and member of the Feminist Research Institute and the Quebec Network of Feminist Studies. Olivier Turbid, uh, professor at the Department of Social and Public Communication at UCAN. Director of the Caisse Chartier Press Analysis Laboratory at UCAM, Associate Researcher with the Chair of Public Relations and Marketing Communication. We have also Morgan Gilly, which is Research Coordinator at the Canada Research Chair on Transgender Children and Their Families, and Tommy Planchat, Research Assistant at the Canada Research Chair on Transgender Children and Their Families. We have also collaborators, uh, François Susset, which is a psychologist well known for a very long experience with young people, young trans families. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist, couple and family therapist at Meraki Health Center, co-founder of the Institute for Sexual Minority Health, member of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And we have also other community based organization, Gender Creative Kids, uh, which gave support to um, of young children and families and adolescents uh, in their family, school, and community. So, without further ado, we're going to uh, leave those space for presentation. So the first presentation, uh, well, it will be me, um, <laughs> professional who have experience in trans health and encountered the trans in their caseload. That's going to be followed by uh, myself and Morgan Jelly, who are going to talk about uh, the interviews we did with uh, the trans youth. Then uh, Melanie Millet and Olivier Turbid will present the D-Trans in the media. So they did the media, social media analysis as well. And uh, we will end by a, a reflection on the transition, retransition, interrupted or discontinued transition by Alexandre Barry. So hello, I'm Morgan Gilly, the coordinator of this research. So we are going to present you the preliminary data for, of the professionals who are working with uh, TransU. So Annie will present the data with me. 
and we are presenting on the behalf of the team. So to give you a bit of context, um, we see that there is a increasing media attention on the phenomenon of detransition, but yet this uh, phenomenon is poorly understood and we have uh, not a lot of studies um, which address this issue. So different terminologies are used to refer to different situations uh, like desistance, detransition, discontinuation, and it's not really um, precise. Uh, the, the terminology is not really well defined yet. So the prevalence is unknown and difficult to assess um, because of this lack of uh, a good definition of the different concepts. And several discussions and debates uh, exist on the phenomenon uh, of desistance and persistence, but there is less data on detransition, discontinuation of transitions. So some studies show a high uh, number of desistance but these studies are highly criticized because what we consider uh, to be desistance uh, is not really well defined. And sometimes the youth, uh, for example, show some gender non-conforming behavior when they are children, but when they are growing up, they don't identify as trans. So we consider their desistance. Studies show that few youth uh, discontinued uh, blockers, for example, the treatments uh, that block puberty, and only 3.5% no longer wished gender affirming treatment. So that's a really lower um, number of people who stopped uh, medical treatment for transition. 13.1% of trans and non-binary people had an history of detransition according to a study. So our research question was what is understood to be a discontinuation of transition and detransition. And now we will uh, present you uh, the project on the professionals working in trans health. So for this project, we did a survey of professionals in trans youth health. So it was an online survey accessible via Lyme survey. It was in English and French, and it was open from September uh, to 2020 to January 2021. Uh, the inv invitation to participate uh, circulated broadly um, so we contacted uh, 37 international organizations and specialty clinics offering services to trans youth. Uh, we circulated the invitation on Facebook groups and listserv, including WAS and WPATH. So when we had the service, we did a data analysis using SPSS software. And this, in the survey, we had 21 questions using different levels of measurements, nominal, ordinal, scale, and open. So for example, we asked uh, the characteristics of the respondents and their workplaces. For example, the country, the training they had, the work setting, the professional experience in trans health, organizations, politics, and of care the number of trans youth they followed. We also asked uh, about the characteristics of professional practice with trans youth, like intervention approaches and principles, including informed consent. And finally, we asked about the experiences they had with youth having detransitioned or discontinued their transition. So for example, the number of youth uh, who stopped their transition in their, practi in their practice, the observations they made about these youth, uh, the families, the support network, and services received. 
So who are the participants? Uh, for this uh, survey, we had uh, 147 professionals who participated, including 54 who completed 100% of the survey and 61 who completed 60% of the survey, including the specific questions on transition. So for the analysis, we included these 61 uh, participants uh, who did at least 60% of the survey. 36% uh, completed the survey in French and the rest completed it in English. We can see that uh, we had different disciplines. So 44% of the participants comes from psychology, uh, 24 comes from medicine, 11 come from social work, and we also have professionals coming from other disciplines, for example, counseling. And regarding the countries, uh, we have a big majority of people coming from United States and Canada, but we also have participants from Switzerland, England, France, Belgium, Sweden, New Zealand, and Australia. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about their experience. Uh, so we can see here that the participants are uh, quite experienced with 25% uh, of the sample who have 10 years of more of practice, 29% who've got between five and 10 years, 38% who's got two, between two and five years, and only 8% who's got less than two years. So very, um, very experienced professional and they have followed a lot of youth as well so you can see that 44 percent of our sample followed uh, 51 youth or more and uh, 18 percent between 26 to 50 youth and uh, 26 percent so a quarter between 1 and uh, 11 and 25 and 12 percent between 1 and 10. so again a quite experienced practitioner with trans and non-binary youth We've asked them also uh, about their practice setting, uh, where they practice, uh, where they work. And um, so, uh, as you can see here, most of the participants practice uh, either in uh, public health care and hospital uh, or private practice. And uh, just under 20% practiced in community organization, nonprofit or other sector. Uh, we also asked them about the politics of care of the organization, so how they see uh, the population with whom they work. Uh, so we can see overwhelmingly that the participants work for an um, organization that see the youth as expert in their gender uh, and accompany them into making decisions. Um, a, a small number uh, either did not uh, think that there were explicit uh, politics of care, uh, or uh, that they were more in an approach that uh, they wanted young people to undergo a rigorous evaluation process before undertaking transition. And one participant um, felt that being trans is very difficult. And so their job was to ensure that they avoid taking this path. So we also wanted to know uh, about their professional practice. We just saw the politics of care, so where the, the person is working. Now we wanted to know what intervention approach. So people said they were either working in a trans affirming, trans positive approach with 77%, uh, and 16% of the sample worked in the watchful waiting approach and 7% in other approaches. Um, we also asked them if they had training, uh, specific training in trans health, 72% add some, and also 79% practice informed consent, while 21% did not practice informed consent. Um, we also asked them about their de-trans youth uh, in their professional experience. So here you can see that uh, the, the majority, more than half, uh, has seen some uh, de-trans youth in their caseload, 56% of them did, and there's also 8% who said maybe, uh, so they weren't sure about, about that, and 36% uh, said they did not have any trans youth in their caseload. Uh, when we asked them, so on the 39 who said that they had, or they maybe had, some uh, de-trans youth in their caseload, 82% of them said that it was between one and five youth, 8% uh, said it was between 6 and 10 youth, 
2% between 11 and 12 youth, 20 youth, and 8% 20 youth or more. So most uh, professional that uh, answered our survey uh, only had like a few youth and that was like for those who had some. And so we uh, were interested to see also uh, if there were, and this is just like really descriptive, but uh, we wanted to see where people saw the most trans youth. And so you can see that um, those working in the um, trans affirming approaches um, are those who saw uh, the less uh, the trans youth, whereas those working in the watchful waiting uh, approach saw a, a, a larger number, um, and those who worked in the other approaches as well. Uh, so this is like something that surprised us, um, but we will have to investigate a little bit more, and you also see the distribution of where those people come from as well. And then we wanted to know uh, the proportion between the experience and the number of youth who discontinued because we thought maybe um, those professionals have seen more this de trans youth because they have worked longer or they had uh, more trans youth on their caseload. So when we look at um, how many years of experience they have, those who saw 21 de trans youth or more uh, had uh, 10 year more experience or between five and 10 years experience. Um, but when you look at uh, the those who had one to five youth, there were more professionals who had 10 years and more experience. Uh, so that again is something that surprised us. Um, also, we wanted to see uh, if the total youth following, uh, you know, was uh, related to the number of youth who detrans, because of course, if you see more youth, you might see more detrans youth. But then again, um, you know, those among those people who saw 50 youth, 51 youth and more, uh, you know, there's like three who saw between 21 youth and more, uh, 11 to 20 youth, uh, but the most of them who had 51 youth and more on their caseload, so between one to five youth who discontinued. So this is also uh, an interesting finding. Uh, obviously, those are preliminary. They will need uh, more uh, analysis, but we thought we would present to you today. So uh, what we could say from uh, those very preliminary conclusions is that the data highlight that practitioners working with trans youth are experienced and that most work according to the trans affirming model. Uh, obviously, this is a community-based sample, uh, so it's not representative. You know, people could, uh, you know, answer uh, if they got the link, uh, but we did try to reach out as far as possible to uh, get a professional to answer. Uh, the preliminary result also highlight that over a third of them never had youth who discontinued their caseload. Uh, so that again was surprising because, you know, when we look at media with, you know, this so much media talking about it, we thought it was like going to be in everybody's caseload, where in fact it was not. And uh, that most of those who had uh, trans youth, who de trans, encounter less than five youth. So it doesn't seem to be something that is. Um, everywhere and, and really large number from our survey. 64% um, of participants had or think they had a youth who de trans in their caseload, but so this may be higher than what was previously suggested by uh, Brick and Al, but uh, this is just like a study of hormone blockers. And uh, so us, it was like every youth, uh, every uh, transition that they could have done. And pra practitioner would disclose having the highest number of discontinuation seems to be working. And as I said, it's very preliminary, we need to analyze more, but this seems to be working more according to watchful waiting or other approach than the trans affirming approach. But you know, we need to take into consideration that there's uh, many limitation. Uh, for example, when we ask uh, how many youth did you follow, the highest, uh, the largest uh, answer could be 51 or more. So we don't know if people um, who had the large number of uh, D-trans youth are because they followed 300 youth or something like that. So there's a limit here insofar that we don't know 
how many exactly youth uh, people follow, but this is still something that emerged from our data. Thank you very much. So we are going to talk about the uh, result of the interview with youth. So the presentation is called Talking with Youth Who Said They Are the Trans. And I am going to present with Morgan Gilly, who uh, work on those data with us. So uh, just a little bit of background literature. Um, we know that the phenomenon of the transition is often associated with the idea of regrets. Uh, which is mobilized to promote preventative approach. Um, yet studies show that less than 2% of people have done a transition express regret. So most people don't. Stopping a transition does not always mean that transition should have a cure. Some people who discontinue their transition say it was a necessary step in their development identity consolidation. And um, literature also tell us that uh, if challenge can come with the transition, th this does not mean that the transition is a clinical failure or that clinicians should stop their patient from detransitioning. Life after the transition can be livable, meaningful, and fulfilling. So um, the way we approach uh, this part of the project, um, it's part of the, uh, the three pilot project, which uh, aim to understand what is understood to be discontinuation of transition, the transition resistance. But the focus for these interviews are really to understand uh, what are discontinuer perspective on their journey and how do they feel about their transition and, dis and discontin discontinuation. So we, um, launched this part of the research uh, late 2020. We uh, circulated um, an advertisement to participate, a poster uh, that we circulated on many social media, a group of trans and non-binary people, as well as the trans group. And we also uh, sent uh, the um, advertisement to people we thought might be interested in the project. For them to circulate it in their network. We conducted a 20 semi-structured interview from October to November 2020 and the interview lasted between one to two hours. It is an international study in so far that COVID allowed us to, well, ask us, required us to do the interview uh, through Zoom at this time, and therefore uh, we opened participation internationally. Uh, in, the interview were in English and in French. Uh, we were recruiting people aged between 14 and 25 years old uh, who had done a social and or medical transition and discontinued it. And uh, we did purposive sampling and snowball sampling to recruit those young people and choose them for participation. Um, then uh, we transcribed the interview um, word by word, and we proceeded with a thematic analysis of the material uh, using an inductive approach, uh, and we draw on the uh, software MaxQDA. So this is our sample. So we talked to 20 youth aged between 16 and 25. Uh, we have uh, some diversity in the sample in so far that at least five participants are people of color. They come from USA, Canada, France, Scotland, Finland, Belgium, and Indonesia. And uh, despite the attempt to create, to, to build a diverse sample, we only had one participant who was assigned male at birth. And uh, they are from very diverse gender identities, as we are going to see in a second. So these are our participants. Uh, so we gave them a pseudonym. Uh, you can see on the second column their current pronoun. Uh, so um, it, it varies person per person. Most of them use she, but there are also some people using other pronouns such as they. Um, we also have uh, their uh, assigned gender. As I mentioned, we just got one person who is assigned male at birth. And you can see on the last column, their current gender identity. And this is where uh, we 
thought was really interesting. We asked them to describe their current gender identity. So these are their words. Uh, and so uh, most of them are not really identified as, uh, as cis women. So for this uh, presentation, we will uh, present the preliminary data we found about uh, the feelings that youth expressed uh, in the present about their journey. So because we often hear about regrets, we were wondering if youth really expressed regrets and or if they expressed also other feelings. So here you can see our code tree. Uh, so each column represents a participant and each line is a code or a thematic. Um, and each dot is the number of occurrences in the transcripts. So it's not the volume. Um, so we decided to simplify the analysis to distinguish the feelings emerging from the experience of transition, the feelings emerging from the experience of detransition, and finally, the feelings emerging from the world journey. But keep in mind that it's really difficult to pinpoint exactly um, which part of the journey has an impact on the feelings. So it's more of a continuum of experiences that impact youth present feelings which uh, what we can already see here is that we have a very nuanced portrait uh, youth expressing both negative and positive feelings they also for uh, almost every youth also expressed uh, a positive evolution such as self-acceptance liberation or a blooming process which was very interesting to see so regarding the feelings emerging from the experience of transition, we were surprised that 14 youth expressed positive feelings about their transition journey. Uh, some say they had a successful transition, some are still happy about the changes despite having discontinued their transition. Some youth say they don't have any regrets um, and a lot of youth expressed that transition was a valuable experience and a learning process. Youth also expressed feelings of regrets about the transition. So sometimes it's regrets about having done a transition. Sometimes it's about the physical side effects. For example, having um, vaginal uh, atrophy. Uh, some experience new dysphoria or distress or discomfort with their body because it is no longer aligned with their identity. And youth also express sadness, depression, grief, uh, missing the body pre-transition, and some also expressed anger. We can also see that youth had ambiguous feelings about their transition um, because they both expressed positive and negative feelings at the same time, but also because sometimes they directly express having mixed feelings, not knowing if they regret the transition. And sometimes they also say things like, I wish I didn't do my transition, but uh, I know I would have done it anyway. So it shows that there is a bit of ambivalence uh, toward their transition journey. Uh, here we can see that Shane uh, says she is pretty thankful about having done a transition, even if at the beginning of her detransition, she was frustrated uh, and mad and angry. So really, we can see that the feelings can evolve uh, through time. And now she says that she doesn't regret having done a transition because she would have lived with uh, curiosity uh, if she couldn't do it. So regarding the feelings emerging from the experience of detransition, um, some youth were feeling good about their decision to stop transition. Uh, so sometimes they said they were glad they stopped their transition. And for some youth, knowing that they can still change their mind was um, making the decision to stop easier. 
Uh, however, 16 youth uh, expressed challenging feelings uh, emerging or ongoing during, during the detransition. So sometimes the struggles from the past come back or stay. For example, if they had depression, uh, dysphoria, eating disorders, a lot of youth could still struggle with these problems when they stopped their transition. Some expressed worries about the future after a detransition. Some say changing back their identity can feel weird. Uh, some still feel down or bad sometimes, or are still conflicted about their gender identity. So here, Sons explained that uh, even if she understands and acknowledges the reasons that made her feel dysphoric. She says that acknowledging these feelings doesn't cure dysphoria. And she says, no matter how much I try to hold myself to these morals, like my dysphoria is not just going to go away. I can't just erase the fact that like someday I might want to go on tea, testosterone, and like transition again. And it's unrealistic to think that I can just logic myself out of it. So it shows this ambivalence because sometimes some youth want to stop their transition because they have a different perspective on gender and on transitions, but they sometimes realize that uh, the other options to deal with their dysphoria, for example, not always work. So it can be challenging for them. Regarding the feelings emerging from the war journey, and once again, it's difficult to really distinguish uh, what part of the journey impacts the present feelings. Um, but here, a lot of youth, 18 youth, say that um, expressed actually blooming liberation, self-acceptance after the trans and the trans journey. So some say they feel better since the transition, they feel liberated from gender expectations and what people think, they have more self-acceptance, they feel more comfortable with their assigned gender and or body, and they are more aligned with themselves, detached from their trans ID, and they sometimes feel good about the whole journey. Uh, some also say they accepted their journey, they have come to turn with the changes. They don't want to think about regrets um, and they don't want to go back and do things differently. So it's interesting to see that for many youth, they expressed a well being that wasn't present uh, nor during the transition, but nor um, before the transition. So it's really a, a long process of evolving and blooming. Finally, youth also try to make sense of their journey. So they gave some kind of explanation and some perspective on their journey. And we noticed that the temporality is really important because the way youth perceive their journey really evolves through time and experiences, as we said before. Uh, they also had different perspectives on their past identity. Some youth uh, say they were never trans, while others validate their past experience of transness. And finally, some say that they were non-binary or gender non-conforming all along. Uh, a lot of youth also explain why transition wasn't the right solution, according to them. So 17 youth ex evokes uh, reasons and underlying issues that motivated them to pursue a transition, which actually wasn't the right solution for them. 11 say they wished they had a better support from professionals to have more clarity on these issues and to be offered alternative solutions. So what we can learn from that uh, really preliminary analysis of the data is that a, a very nuanced portrait is emerging 
um, when the youth are reflecting on their journey, sometimes they express regret, but sometimes they also experience feelings like gratitude, growth, and sometimes both. It's also important when we think about the trans, the transition, discontinuation of transition, to take into consideration the impact of temporality on feelings and on the way that the young person is uh, understanding their, their experience. Uh, their discourse vary depending on uh, where the youth is at in their journey when they are talking to us. And it also depends at what moment or stage of their journey they are commenting on. So there are two, as two aspects of temporality to take care of here. The expression of regret, gratitude and growth can result from transition, detransition or both. But the delimitation between the two is blurry in youth's narrative. So it's important to consider youth journey as a continuum of experience, which all impact on their present feeling. So it's not just about the transition that's going to have had an impact, but it might so well be because of the, the transition or the whole thing together. Transition, even if no longer satisfying the youth, may have contributed to deconstruct, deconstructing what gender is and to flourish overall their own journey. And discontinuating a transition does not mean going back, as we can see from the, um, the table of participants. Uh, it's not necessarily from going from A to B to A, but sometimes we can have people who get, most of the time we get people going from A to B to C. Uh, youth express a large range of identity and not just cis or assigned identity. So in terms of way forward for research and practice, uh, we think that we need to reflect on furthering gender affirming approaches to explore how uh, in a consensual way, various possibilities to address uh, the youth issues. Stopping transition can be challenging, which raised the question of support for those D-trans youth. Uh, we've not presented uh, those data today, but you know, it can be an isolating experience. Qualitative analysis is needed to help us understand the diversity and the complexity of experience under the D-trans umbrella. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Melanie Millet, and I have the privilege to conduct the media fold of the research project with Dr. Olivier Turbide and Edith Parirois, our main assistant on the project. So we analyzed the media coverage of detransition as part of the detrans project led by Annie Pulen saint façon And I'm thrilled to share our preliminary results and conclusion with you today. So to begin with, a bit of context on how media cover gender and sexual diversity at large. Over the last several decades, uh, the media visibility of LGBTQ plus communities has increased, but this growth uh, impacts each subgroup unevenly. Um, as an example, gay men are the most visible group in the mass media, while visibility of transgender folks remains low. When it comes to transition itself, Capuzza has analyzed American coverage uh, in the press and their results show that media coverage of trans people focuses on soft news and lacks in-depth reports such as news from the sports, arts and entertainment and style section. Second finding, in their pieces, journalists employed more expert sources such as health professional and cited them more often than, tran than transgender sources. So trans folk have less quotes and less space in their media visibility, a situation that could lead to the development of a narrative dominated by expert sources. And when they appear as a source, transgender voices were largely limited to commentary about individual life experience. As to the media coverage of the transition, we find only one scientific article dedicated to the phenomenon. According to Slapower analysis, the three main themes in this coverage are the invisibilization of trans people. So article discuss mainly the James Caspian case 
Uh, he's a psychotherapist whose proposed master thesis on the topic of D slash retransition was rejected by Bath Spa University's ethics board. Second main finding, the desire to protect children from misdiagnosis. Uh, so in response to the increased perceived visibility of trans individuals in the media, several articles talk about disastrous, quote unquote, repercussion of D slash retransition for children. And the last main theme, the trends of social contagion and the diagnosis of rapid onset gender dysphoria. So, and then, so this idea is apparently supported by an increase in rates of children, adolescents, and youth adults presenting to clinics with gender dysphoria. Our main research question for this research is, what is understood to be a discontinuation of transition? Detransition, desistance in the media. So we have included synonyms to harvest as much data as possible. Our two main, ob main objectives are to understand um, to understand and analyze the way media talk about the transition or one of its synonym and what emerges in terms of the framing it provides. The second main objective is to identify main rhetorical pattern at play in the media coverage when it comes to the phenomenon of gender the transition and the people involved in this process. Our epistemological grounding is social constructivism of news discourse. And for this presentation, we refer to the framing theory. So uh, critical discourse analysis or CDA is uh, an approach which recognizes the ideological dimension of language and which through a fine and contextual analysis of the discourse attempts to reveal the underlying uh, relations of power in the discourse. Uh, in media and journalism studies, the framing theory is used to demonstrate the impact of how journalists and media package and present a certain topic. So this framing effect occurs mainly through the choices of images and vocabulary to represent a certain reality. As an example, uh, when reporting on the same topic, if a news title reads, the problem with gender transition, or the reality of gender transition, the framing effect, the bias induced to the audience is different. For this presentation, we focus on press coverage um, the, of the transition. Um, so in terms of methodology, we have harvested data from June 1st, 2017 to December 31st, 2020. We selected the date of June 1st because an important law bill in, the Can uh, in Canada against trans discrimination was passed on June 16th in 2017. Thus, it increased the momentum in terms of transition and pot potentially the transition media coverage. Um, the data was collected from two databases, Factiva and Eureka, to retrieve news worldwide, including the United States, Canada, and European countries in both English and French. The databases were interrogated with an exhaustive list of keywords, as you see here. Our research team is using NVivo coding. Through meetings and co-work with our research assistant, Edith, and also Joseph Dipiano and Elia Chartrand de Jardin, we have developed a hybrid coding grid based on the literature and emerging topics from the data. A, do a total of 208 codes were used and uh, thematic analysis and rhetorical analysis were then conducted. Our final corpus consists of 193 distinct news articles coming mostly from the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada and Australia. News in French represent only 4% of the corpus and the Canadian proportion is the same. More precisely, 660 units of analysis were codified. Each unit referred to a portion of content that contains a keyword related to the existence or the transition or one synonym. So this slide shows the distribution of the data of the news uh, by separate media outlet. Obviously, British newspapers represent uh, the main contribution here because they represent a bit less than one third of the overall media coverage. More specifically, the Daily Mail UK, The Times, The Telegraph and The Guardian have published the most on the transition, as you can see here. 
So the Australian is the outsider here. We can't really explain its dominance. But it's worth mentioning that all the news from the Australian in our corpus were written by the same journalists. The rest of the media coverage, so the part in yellow here, uh, consists of news from various media venues, also mainly from the UK, including Scotland and Ireland, and also the United States. In terms of distribution over time, a uh, few news articles have been published between 2017 to uh, 2019. The, tr the transition media coverage has, in has clearly augmented in 2020, although it remains a niche topic. More specifically in 2020, what we see here is that the Carabelle lawsuit and the GK Rowling's controversy uh, on transphobic tweets have increasingly shaped the media production. So um, in June 2020, GK Rowling, the well-known Harry Potter author, posted a transphobic tweet that sparked a controversy in social media and eventually captured the attention of the press. A couple of days later, she used her website to voice concern about what she described as quote unquote, an explosion of young people assigned female at birth, seeking gender affirming care, as well as a growing number of the transitioning. So this was the first uh, peak in our uh, media uh, data gathering. Then Carabelle, um, so she was 16 when she began taking uh, puberty blockers and at 23, she did transition and brought a legal action against the Tavistock and Portman NHS Trust, which runs the UK's only gender and identity development service for children. So the lawsuit in October 2020 and later the decision of the UK High Court uh, in December both correspond to two peaks in the media coverage. When it comes to the news format distribution, our corpus show interesting characteristics. Almost half of the detransition coverage includes longer, more contextualized formats such, such as editorials, columns, reportage, and interviews. In these long formats, more space is given to testimonials and shared experience of detrans persons. Typically, health specialists are, are also interviewed. Um, these proportions are rarely seen in media coverage. So just as an example, when we look at climate change and how it's covered in the media, well, it's usually flooded by short news articles and less than 25% of the coverage will be represented by longer formats. So this is very unique. In terms of vocabulary, in our corpus of 193 news article, detransition and its derived words like detransitioners or detrans is, more, is used more often than its synonym with a total of 552 occurrences. This instance is the second best with 139 mention in the, the whole corpus. Um, that being said, most of the news are on transition itself because yeah, our results show that the transition has been treated as a secondary aspect in the media since 2017 to 2020. Typically, the news will cover transition or the Carabelle lawsuit or the GK Rowling affair and then address the question of detransition. So detransition, the main, uh, detransition remain um, the main topic in only 13% of the news gathered in their corpus. Moreover, when we go further in our analysis, Nearly 60% of the news mentioned at least once the transition as a proof that transition was a mistake in the first place. Um, this way of presenting the transition and transition influences the perception of both phenomena of the transition and transition. So a bias against transition is built through the words selected to depict the reality. Specifically, the framing effect occurs through the word mistake per se, but also a lexical field with regrets, uh, sorrow, expressions like long journey of gender confusion, self-deception, et cetera, et cetera. And only 4.1% of the news in the corpus mention at least once the transition as a milestone in a fluid identity trajectory. So it's very it's a very low number. Um, so not only is the transition a niche topic addressed more often as a secondary aspect in news about something else, 
but its coverage is broadly framed as the negative result of a transition. Our analysis also showed that 25.4% of the news mentioned at least once the transition as the result of being misdiagnosed by a medical professional, which led to transitioning. And 15.5% of the article mentioned at least once a mental health issue such as depression, bipolar disorder, or dysmorphia as a cause for the misdiagnosis, which led to the unnecessary transition, meaning that other treatment, treatments should have been considered and offered to the person. So this slide exposes the typical rhetorical structure of anti-trans news. So not all the news were clearly anti-trans, but as, as our results show, well, there's a good proportion of it. So in these article, transition is first framed as an undesirable phenomenon resulting from a misdiagnosis. Detransition is then positioned as a proof of this mistake and has an important and has important consequences such as infertility and um, uh, it affects sexual functions. And then these anti-trans articles generally conclude by criticizing or advocating for better psychological and medical gatekeeping for young people living with psychological distress. So this overall rhetorical structure is recurrent. And its main ideological consequences is an implicit denial of trans identity. So finally, our preliminary conclusion is that first, the press coverage of the transition depicts the medical body and health professional as responsible for misdiagnosis that wrongly led people to transitioning. Second, the media report two main critiques. The first one is interviewees critique insufficient medical gatekeeping, such as uh, uh, access to medical, a good medical diagnosis, medical treatment, and support. Interestingly, about half of the critiques came from the transitioners themselves, a quarter from healthcare professional, a quarter from other sources, as an example, public figure, writers, activists, legal professional. And there is a negligible number of parents that have formulated complaints. And the second main critique comes from the medical body. So the medical body critiques the quote unquote facility with which kids and teen can access hormones. So, um, in general, folks that have the transition wish there were there were more uh, gatekeeping in terms of you know more profession uh, more psychological evaluations, uh, more sessions with various specialists, so that the access to transition would be stricter. In part, they believe that too easy access to transition, coupled with inadequate professional care, led them to make the wrong choice about transitioning instead of dealing with their quote unquote true problem. And these results, it shows a complex reality because the articles were quite empathetic and respectful of people that did transition. Thus, we could think that the coverage is sensitive to identities issues quite open, but the combined effect of these testimonies, the, test the testimonies of physis physicians and the general framing of the transition as a way to quote unquote correct a mistake um, of an unwanted transition creates a third harmful critique whereby the transition is the result as, of a misdiagnosis, for example. So despite the care with which the transitioner's narrative are reported with respect and dignity uh, by the media, these two main critiques combined with the framing effect of the transition as a proof of the mistake creates a third critique towards the transition itself. So I thank you for listening and I'm looking forward for eventually a conversation about this. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. When Annie poulin Sanfasson, principal investigator of the DTrans Research Project, approached me to join the research team, I was very interested to join the team due to my long term interest in the questions of detransition. I, together with uh, Marjorie Silverman, have worked on the question of detransition in a study on transholder adults living with dementia. We wrote about the type of interventions that should be put forward in case some of them forget the transition or re-identify with their sex assigned at birth. I was excited to, by the idea of delving into the topic of detransition from the other end of the age spectrum. Based on my observations at that time, I noticed that the discourses on detransition in the case of both young people and older adults seem to emerge from clinical perspectives and be crystallized around the idea that if detransitions occur, it is because transitions should not have occurred in the first place. According to this logic, the transitions were mistakes. These hasty conclusions were soon picked up by the media to fuel anti-trans sentiments and worries about transaffirmative healthcare. I also noticed that the trans communities, activists and researchers were quick to dismiss the reality of detransition itself and to deconstruct those empirical studies on surgical regrets, on desistance, and on the now infamous rapid onset gender dysphoria or ROD popularized by Littman. I myself participated, for example, with Florence Ashley in this wave of scholarship that showed that studies on ROD desistance and detransitions are flawed on so many levels and constitute bad science. These studies not only have important methodological limitations, but they also raise ethical and political issues in relation to what is done or not done to trans and non-binary people. There is, however, one thing that struck me as a similar um, between the discourses on detransition on both older adults and youth and the reactions to them. The similarity is that the attitude of the trans communities, activists, and scholars that endorse transaffirmative perspective is a no-go, a denial of the possibility of detransition. For example, in our research on the various interventions potentially offered to trans older adults living with dementia who detransition or re-identified with their sex assigned at birth, Marjorie Silverman and I identify three potential strategies. The first, a gender neutralization approach that consists essentially of avoiding gender altogether. A second, a transaffirmative stable approach that insists on the trans chosen identity and negates the possibility of a detransition. And the third one, a trans affirmative fluid approach that recognizes the possibility of a detransition and privileges supporting the person in the here and now. We showed that most scholarship from a trans positive perspective, as well as trans community organizations and activists endorse the second approach. Detransition in that case is explained mostly through two factors. Either the person is cognitively impaired by dementia and is confused, an interpretation we characterize as ableist insaneness, or the person is seen as pressured by external factors to detransitions, such as cisgender society or family. There is likewise a growing literature on youth from a transaffirmative approach that insists on the fact that regrets follow, following transaffirmative healthcare are extremely rare and that most desisters or detransitioners have probably been unduly influenced by external pressures to detransition. In some, detransition appears as a repudiated subject among a majority of transaffirmative proponents. Looking at the reactions to the discourses on detransitions, I think that the denial of the existence of detransition altogether 
um, <clears throat> or the quick dismissal of its significance through the usage of low statistics of regrets or the explanations of detransition solely on the basis of external cisgenderist pressures ignore the complexity of the issues at stake and therefore do not serve our communities and scholarship. I would even say that through a performative mechanism, we produce the entity we try to reject. Indeed, by trying to combat cisgenderist conclusions in the studies on desistance and detransition, and by painting detransition as the antithesis of transition, we contribute to creating a monolithic perception of detransition as something bad that casts a shadow on trans communities and the care they can or cannot access. In other words, fighting against cisgenderist discourses on detransition paradoxically creates and reinforces one homogenous view of that phenomenon that erases its complexity. Going back to our research project, it was clear based on those observations that we needed to complexify the discourses on detransitions through empirical data with people who detransitions themselves. The interviews with those youth would allow us to get a better picture of their lived experience and to start shifting the power imbalance when it comes to who says what on detransition. We thought it was important that this that discourses on detransition don't emerge only from research teams that are conservative, anti-trans, and cautious about transaffirmative approach, but also from research teams that are embracing a transaffirmative fluid approach. There is indeed a huge gap to fill in order to start understanding, supporting, and providing care for people who detransition from a trans-positive perspective. Furthermore, as attested in several articles on the D-trans phenomenon, there is much confusion surrounding um, terms such as detransition, desistance, retransition, and so forth. For example, Expositos Campos proposes the following distinction, quote, the typology proposed in this article distinguishes between two main types of detransition, core or primary, and non-core or secondary detransitions. In core detransitions, the decision is primarily motivated by the cessation of a transgender gender identity. In non-core detransitions, the decision is influenced by reasons other than the cessation of a transgender identity. This category potentially includes anyone who stops or reverses their, their gender transition, but continues to identify as transgender. Some authors, such as Eli Vandebush, who identifies herself as a female detransitioner, endorse that distinctions between self-identification versus the process of detransition itself. In a similar way, Ildebrand Chup distinguishes between people who endorse the detransitioner identification and those who don't but still have detransition. Quote, to refer to the broader category of individuals who are or have been in the process of detransition, whether they adopt a detransitioner identity or not, I use the admittedly awkward phrase, people who have detransition. And the author talk about all the reasons why a person could detransition. So to avoid this awkward uh, expression, I would propose that in order to distinguish between the two types, we describe the second type as people who discontinued their transition. While not all detransitioners endorse cisgenderist discourses, I contend, following those authors, that their reality is quite different than the reality of people who discontinued their transition but sometimes still identify as trans, non-binary, agender, gen genderless, gender indifferent, but who discontinued their transition for a wide variety of reasons. 
On the one hand, while the detransitioners could potentially maintain more contentious relationships with trans communities, since there is a clear break with the trans identity, those who discontinued their transition are more likely to remain connected in some way with trans communities. In fact, preliminary results from our research con conducted with youth show that for many of them, while there could be some negative feelings related to the transition, their transition and detransition journey as a whole also had positive effects within their lives and in their exploration of their gender identity. On the other hand, distinguishing the two types avoids lumping um, together a very diverse group of people. Since many people who detransition don't identify as detransitioners, and since the people I would describe as having discontinued their transition often maintain some links with LGBTQ communities, identities, and politics, it would seem important to start reflecting on the reality and of these individuals and to work to create safer spaces in our communities to welcome their experiences. While this conceptual distinction between detransitioners and people who discontinued their transition might be relevant for studying the phenomenon, it is important to remember that the line between the two should not be seen as rigid, of course. I would like to conclude by discussing the notions of cis-normativity and compulsory biographical continuity. In 29, I coined the term cisgender normativity and cisnormativity to uh, refer to the normative component of the cisgender system. Due to anglo-normativity and other factor and the lack of visibility of notions, concepts, and ideas in languages other than English, the definition proposed the same year by Bauer and collaborator, according to which cisnormativity is, quote, the expectation that all people are cissexual, which corresponds to Julia Serrano definition of cissexual assumption, got popularized. And we can see it's the same thing for other notions such as uh, transnormativity. So I propose <clears throat> at that time conceptual nuances to offer a broader definition of cisnormativity to refer to the norm according to which it is better to not change your identity or body than to transform them. I also mobilize the notions of cisnormativity with an asterisk to refer to the normative um, system that broadly normalizes identities that remain unchanged. In a recent article with Marjorie Silverman, we reuse this notion of cisnormativity in a broader sense to refer to, quote, the idea that people should not change in radical ways, but rather follow prescriptive societal norms and expectations in relation to the continuity of the self. We argued that cisnormative expectations fuels what we call compulsory biographical continuity. That is the idea that someone should maintain a continuity in their personhood, in their self, in terms of abilities, cognition, gender, and so forth. Any interruptions, disruptions, transformation, or transition is seen as impacting this moral injunction to remain relatively the same person across lifespan. From that perspective, it becomes possible to see how both transitions and detransitions transgress the compulsory biographical continuity and cisnormative injunctions, even though, paradoxically, someone who would retransition would go back to what the cisgender normative system was hoping for them in the first place. That reconceptualization of cisnormativity raises many questions. And one of them is, is it simply transition toward trans identity that elicits negative reactions? Or is it more generally, regardless the direction it points toward, that creates discomfort and uh, illicit reactions? <clears throat> 
In conclusion, I contend that it would be productive to start reflecting on the complex interlocking effects of cisgenderism and cisism, that is, quote, the oppressive system that discriminates against people on the basis of change in order to better understand the difficult lived experience of trans, non-binary, and agender people, as well as people who discontinue their transition, who detransition, or retransitioned. We don't need to see detransitions and transition discontinuations as menaces to trans issues, but it could be productive to embrace them as another layers in the rich galaxies of gender identities we are fighting for. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for those really uh, interesting presentation. Uh, there were a lot to learn from those. Uh, we had presentation looking at the experience of professional uh, working with trans youth. Uh, we had presentation looking at uh, trans youth themselves uh, and their experience in tra detransitioning. We had uh, a presentation, an excellent presentation on uh, media and also on, um, on approaches. Mm. Yeah, and it was really, uh, interesting to see that in the media there is this rhetoric uh, framing around the idea of regrets and um, showing that uh, depainting transition as something negative because um, this can result in the transition and it's interesting to see that it's uh, not totally what we observe when we talk to youth who stop their transition. Yeah, indeed. Uh, you know, I think the presentation uh, we look at interview, uh, well, you described really clearly actually looking at themes that emerge from the interview, how uh, different trajectories are not just about regret or about gratitude, but it's often a combination of that. And that also we need to really pay an attention to uh, about uh, what the young person is commenting on. So this, just looking at, at, the, at the experience of youth from their interview, um, there is already some contrast uh, with what we can see emerging from the media uh, as Melanie presented. And also we can see that it is not uh, that frequent, uh, yet there's been kind of a, an increased uh, visibility of those story in the media. This is not to say that those young people um, you know, are not important, uh, quite the contrary. Uh, those young people uh, have expressed important needs and especially needs to be uh, better accompanied. Mm, yeah, and in that sense, I think it's really important what uh, Alexander explained about um, having a fluid uh, transaffirming approach, uh, which recognizes uh, both the identity of trans youth, but also the identity of de-trans youth. It's important not to uh, shadow this phenomenon, uh, but to really um, address it and see that it exists and it's uh, one of the journeys that youth can take. And um, it is part of uh, the um, diversity of genders and, and diversity of genders identity. Uh, from what we see, uh, and I think that may bring us to uh, further the reflection on uh, trans-affirming practices and how we can um, better accompany those young people without increasing gatekeeping or constraints, because young people who are in front of process of gatekeeping, and we saw that in other research projects that we didn't discuss today, but they tend to adapt their narrative um, to fit what the professional in front of them want to hear. So the future of trans affirming practice is really um, towards a better accompaniment of those young people, uh, a non-constraining accompaniment where they can really uh, explore freely uh, their gender identity, but also any other difficulties that they might experience in their life. Uh, so they can, they can gain 
uh, clarities for themselves in their process of self-discovery, what is the best uh, way uh, forward to them. So much more to do and to think about in terms of uh, working with trans youth and the trans youth for the next few years. So mm. thank you very much everyone for being here. Mm. Thank you.